After the mass lockdown in China, the entire nation of Italy has been quarantined as it tries to contain the spread of coronavirus. But here in the UK, the focus is more about self-isolation and hand washing. So what approaches are working and can we protect people and the economy? This is Roundtable. Hello there, I'm Shuli Ghosh. Billions ill around the world, a rocketing death toll, global recession and health services crumbling under the strain. The worst case scenarios for coronavirus make for grim reading. So are Italy's emergency measures going to be followed in other countries and is enough being done to contain the damage? The coronavirus outbreak has caused chaos and disruption globally. Italy imposed emergency quarantine measures, locking down the nation of over 60 million people. Universities, schools and public institutions have been closed and travel only allowed on an emergency basis to contain the spread of the coronavirus. In South Korea, authorities have encouraged people to work from home. The top health official there has said he hopes his country has reached the peak of the virus, which infected thousands nationwide. Many medical experts praise China's sweeping lockdowns in the early stages of the outbreak, and from late February, the number of new cases went down. But economists fear the outbreak, coupled with a historic fall in oil prices, could trigger a worldwide recession. UN bodies estimate COVID-19 could cost the global economy over $1 trillion in 2020. The aviation industry has been hit particularly as flights get cancelled and quarantine measures take effect. Experts estimate the sector will lose up to $113 billion this year. As steps are taken to fight the spread of the virus, the decisions governments make now could have lasting consequences. Let me introduce today's guests. Joining me at the round table is Jumana Salahin, chief economist at commodities company CRU Group. She's been looking at the impact of the virus outbreak on global economies. Dr. Bob Gill, who's a family doctor and health service campaigner. And Professor Sean Griffiths, who chaired the Hong Kong government's inquiry into the SARS epidemic. Uh, good to have all of you with me. Uh, Sean, let me start with you, because we're, we're hearing now that the number of new cases um, in, uh, in China, uh, the rate of that is declining. So um, what, what, how do you understand the situation at the moment? It would appear that the lockdown in Wuhan and in Hubei province has been successful because the numbers of cases in Wuhan itself are falling, in Hubei are falling, and there are no new uh, indigenous cases in China, in the rest of China. Uh, what they are seeing, though, is um, imported cases, so people coming back to China from Iran, from Italy, from South Korea. So the Chinese authorities are looking at uh, what they need to do to stop a second wave, which comes from imported cases rather than those from the epicenter in Wuhan. So a lot of um, criticism uh, in the early days certainly was that uh, the China uh, Chinese government's reaction was very draconian, uh, the way it imposed the lockdown. Uh, of course, it's had an impact in the economy. But from what you're saying, it, it seems to have been working. It, it seems to have worked because... Uh, once the situation, they could see how serious the situation was. Once they could see how serious the situation was, that if you look at basic public health, you, you know, isolate, uh, contact trace, uh, find where the source of the, uh, the infection, and then try to keep the numbers as low as possible by quarantine. And I think that was the philosophy. And the uh, absolute isolation of Wuhan was the only way to keep a grip on those rapidly escalating numbers we were seeing at the end of January, beginning of February. But Jumana, this has all had a massive impact on China's economy and now we're seeing Italy uh, also imposing a nationwide quarantine. I mean, in terms of the global economy, this is a disaster. So that's absolutely right that the coronavirus is leading our estimates of the loss to economic growth to be lower in 2020. What we don't know yet is the extent of that downgrade to the forecast for 2020 and beyond. And that's because we don't know the extent to which it's going to carry on in Europe, the extent to which it might come about in the US. So those are some unknown factors. Because some of the forecasts are now predicting 
another global recession. That's right. I think it's important to first of all say, well, what is a global recession? And I think there is no standard global recession definition as there is for a, a country's recession, which would be two quarters of negative growth. That is for a particular country. But for a global recession, it's when global growth is below 2%. That's the standard definition that we use. And what we're seeing is before the coronavirus, growth estimates for the global economy was of the order 2.5%. Now that we've seen the virus outbreak and we've seen, first of all, China affected, we revised down our growth forecast to just over two. But now people are saying if this becomes a more widespread um, epidemic, it can go under two, which, which would be a global recession. So let's talk about the impact on, on uh, health care and the government response here, um, Bob, because uh, whilst we've seen these kind of measures in Italy and other places, uh, Madrid, for example, schools being closed, big events being cancelled, um, the UK seems to have taken a more cautious response. It's still in the first phase, um, which is about containment, and it hasn't gone as far as to, to, to close schools. Uh, what do you think, as a, as a healthcare professional, of the, the government response here? Has it been robust enough? Well, I don't think so. There have been unclear messages from government. Boris Johnson only yesterday, I believe it was, was saying we should take it on the chin and let the virus uh, affect us and let's get on with it. That was literally what he said. Um, but we need to understand the context within the how the NHS is at the moment. And we've had 10 years of austerity. We've lost 17,000 beds. We have 40,000 nurse vacancies, 10,000 doctor vacancies. There isn't the spare capacity within the NHS to cope with the significant influx of And we're about patients. to enter a phase where we might see significantly fewer healthcare workers because of the new immigration rules imposed. Exactly. We've seen, we've seen that we've seen. So can our, can our healthcare service cope? Well, the answer, if, if you ask frontline clinicians and doctors, there was a survey published only last week, 1,600 doctors in terms of is the NHS prepared. Only eight out of 1,600 said we are ready. So that's less than 1%. Whereas Matt Hancock, the health secretary, is saying that there's no problem. We can just up, upscale 5,000 intensive care unit beds. Where from? We don't have the staff. We don't have the capacity. And looking after coronavirus patients is far more difficult than the standard patient on ITU because you have to take all the extra precautions to look after them. Right. Um, we're getting this, this kind of dual narrative in which some people are really panicking over coronavirus. We've seen supermarket shelves um, picked clean and uh, people saying that, you know, quite rightly, it's highly contagious. Other people, including President Donald Trump, saying it's flu is worse. What is the... Real situation. You need to find the middle way. It's, it may sound sort of like an, uh, a rhetorical, but, but yes, this is a serious virus. And the reason it's a serious virus is it's a new virus. So we don't know how it's going to affect us. We, don't, we haven't got immunity in the population. And we know it affects older people more than younger people. And they're the most likely to have the, the more serious disease. And some of them will unfortunately pass away. So we know that we've got a threat here. But at the same time, we also know that public health measures work. And we know that if we look at the SARS epidemic in 2003. Now, this is something, an that, inquiry that you looked yes, at. Yes, I, so... I, I co-chaired the Hong Kong government SARS inquiry in 2003. And we looked at all the lessons that could be learned uh, at that time from, from then, because we did a retrospective look to see how did Hong Kong cope. And there are some differences and some similarities from last time round. It's the same sort of virus. It comes from the same sort of origin in terms of that it, uh, probably the reservoir is bats, probably it goes through the, the um, markets, uh, the wet markets, and is transferred to man. And then it's highly infectious because we don't, we can't, have no immunity right. for it. So uh, the difference is this time is, although there was some delay in China, we now know, in China letting the world know about the new virus, last time round, we didn't know until really a long way through the epidemic what the virus was. So and, we knew a lot quicker uh, So we knew a lot time. quicker. We were able to, um, the scientists around the world got a, a sort of grouping together as opposed to sitting in little corners uh, trying to develop um, the vaccine and progress on the vaccine is, is going pretty well. Um, um, but it's still going but to be... But it's going to be a year. So, yes. so we've got to deal with this spout. The, there's some uh, uh, work on the antiviral drugs that are being used and so we can learn from Wuhan. So we've got a lot of clinical learning from Wuhan about what might work, which is much better than trial and error. So this so, time um, around we I, have some I don't some want of to, to, to be the, the, the doom and gloom monger here, but... The, 
if this goes on for any length of time, how are we going to cope uh, as uh, communities, nations? I mean, for example, um, in, in terms of the economy, we saw stock markets crashing. The Dow Jones had to be suspended. Uh, airlines have, have gone out of business. There are flights cancelled. Well, the tourism industry must be in tatters. Is that something that we're going to recover from quickly, even if even if a vaccine was brought out tomorrow? Yeah. So I think I think the way that we've thought about this, what what we've had is because the virus outbreak was originally in China, and CRU. We have um, two offices based in China, right. one in Beijing and one in Shanghai. So we could talk to them and we could learn about how this virus is spreading, it's spreading and the nature of the disruptions to transport, to people. And what we learned from that was that the nature of the shock was such that if people can't go out and spend their money, there's a demand shock. So, for example, around the Chinese New Year, it's very common for them to go out, buy a house, buy a new car. That's what they do around Chinese New Year. And those big ticket items, people haven't done that. So there's been a fall in demand. So it's a demand shock. That's one thing. Secondly, there's also a supply shock because people aren't going to work, so they can't produce the goods and services. I mean, this is, the, this is what has been critical for the rest of the world. China That's right. is the supply chain hub of the world. So That's if that right. closes down... Um, that's going to have a knock-on effect on, on many other economies. That's right. So I think the first stage where we downgraded our forecast, I mentioned earlier, we downgraded by about 0.3 to 0.5. That was based entirely on China being the factory to the world, providing 66% of the intermediate outputs used by the rest of the world. So that was one factor. Now we, what we see in Italy as well, northern Italy, is also the powerhouse. There's lots of car manufacturing, there's lots of car production, and we've seen an impact on the supply as well. But going back to your question, you know, can we ride through this? I think if it's controlled well, the virus can be brought under control, which we have seen has happened in China. Now in China, we're hearing from our offices that Capacity is coming back on stream, and it's about 50% capacity back on stream. People are back our work. Production has resumed. And it will probably take a few more months for that to reach 100%. So what you can see is a V-shaped downturn where global growth plummets down in the near term. And then, and then it recovers back. quite quickly if it's contained. How okay, I want to talk to you about what, what measures um, governments are taking to help uh, yeah. help us ride out the economy. But I want to ask um, Bob, we were just talking there about the SARS epidemic of 2003. Um, it, sitting here now talking about coronavirus, it doesn't feel as though um, th that was as big as coronavirus. Have the, were there lessons learned? I mean, how, in, in any, any epidemic, health services of any country are going to be stretched. But uh, were there lessons learned, do you think, that we should be looking at here? What was the impact of SARS and what the government have been up to in terms of their austerity program and their covert privatisation program didn't change. So where I work in South East London, Kent border, uh, we were facing the loss of our intensive care unit and the downgrading of our casualty department in Lewisham. That's despite having lost thousands of beds already. So the political agenda continues along the track of taking us to an American style healthcare system. But we're already seeing that when the government acts centrally in a coordinated, organised manner, it can have a significant in, uh, effect in mitigating the impact of a pandemic. And uh, it will be interesting to see in future what the outcomes were in, let's say, America compared to China, compared to Singapore, compared to our part privatised and overstretched NHS, which the government have created. So in terms of how many deaths, I mean, we were talking about, um, when we introduced the programme, about the possible yes. worst case scenario. Well, I it mean... is worst case scenario, and it's based on modelling based out of Wuhan, the lessons that were learned in China. And it's that uh, if you take a virus like this with its reproduction number, uh, the very worst case scenario is it would affect 80% of the population before it started right. to decline. That's very worst case. In China, I think it only got to about 20%. 
at, at the height. Uh, so we know that very worst case. So in public health, and Public Health England have been uh, working very hard on the modelling and the response to the modelling uh, because they're the public health agency. But what do you think about the, the different approaches we've seen in different countries? Well, so they, you have they China depend. and Italy on the one but hand, and then Korea, UK have wash your hands a lot. Uh, well, that, no, but that's because they have the UK... The UK pattern is contain, delay, then mitigate and underpin with research. Should now, there that not is... be a standardised response? You can't standardise. It depends on culture. It depends on the nature of your health service. It depends on a huge number of factors. The Wuhan lockdown was possible because it was within the Chinese state system. In Korea, they haven't had a lockdown. What they've done is they've really upped the information, use of information and technology. And they've been testing, testing, testing. So their testing figures are very high. And they've started to see a downturn in, in the death rate as well. So there's been a huge information. And very importantly that uh, here is that um, treatment for the disease is free and you have to make testing free, the treatment has to be free. So our NHS is under strain but it is free at the point of need and that is a hugely important uh, th um, uh, thing to remember because if you're in America uh, they say that the test may be free, may be free, but the ancillary services you have mm. to pay for. So if you're you know, you're someone who doesn't have that much resource, you may not want to go forward, you may not want to lose your job because so what's your... So governments have to really think governments about... Governments have to think this ...how through. they can get yes. people to the point of actually and being And you have tested. to believe your government, because the Koreans have spent a lot of time, I think they have two media briefings a day, they send you SMSs, they have done things we might not agree with, which is the, if you have a case, they'll tell you if they're near you, so if you... I might get a bleep on my phone if you were a case. So, you know, there are things that we may find culturally very difficult. Right. But, uh, and they've used surveillance cameras and things. So their technology is different, but it fits the population. Do you, do you think we've had enough information about... Well, I, I think the problem we aren't addressing is the trust issue. So if you have Matt Hancock, our health secretary, saying everything's fine, everything's under control, but the frontline clinicians are saying 99% of them, we are not ready, then that destroys trust. So either they, these politicians keep out of the way and leave it to the professionals because they're undermining the faith we have in the system. But I know from my personal experience and also talking to clinicians that are working on the front line, they feel the system is at tipping point and it wouldn't take much to cause a lot of, lot of damage and destruction. So if we convert um, surgical theatres, for example, into temporary intensive care units, then where are the operations going to take place? people waiting complex surgery who might need an intensive care bed afterwards for cancer or significant heart disease or transplant surgery, mm. they have to wait longer. And that will have a potential uh, harm to them and potential death to those people. So we might manage the coronavirus well, but we displace other people because of the lack of spare capacity. Um, what do you think about I mean, I think, I, think, I think there's quite a fine line to be tread here because, as I said, if you, if you have a lockdown, then people can't go to work and there's disruptions on the supply side so you can't produce the goods and services. You know, if well, we recovered quite well as a world economy after SARS, didn't we? Is that because the economy was quite resilient at that time? Or? I think it was a very different shock and you're the yes. expert on it, but I think it was kind of more contained yes. within right. within yeah. that region, whereas now it's kind of much it more... Seems much more widespread. And, and there was a, a definitely... What it did was uh, once the GDP started to fall uh, in about, I think, the August or September, it was noticeable, then mainland China opened the border to allow the Chinese... Uh, the Hong Kong economy to be boosted by um, well, people Is there a risk to... of that happening now, that, that measures will be curtailed quicker than they should be to allow economic activity to resume? So I think, I mean, obviously that's a really good question, but I don't think that's what's happening. So I think we've seen reports from the Ministry of Transport in China saying, whenever you travel on a bus, leave a spare seat next to you. Mm -hmm. In lifts, there's a, there's a limit of four people. There's still quite a lot of um, uh, measures in place to make sure that there is kind of social distancing and social isolation. So those measures are continuing, I would you say. Said you said you, you've got offices in, We've in got China. We've got two offices in China. Did you get China. information right from the get-go about Absolutely. what was happening? Yes, we've got 35 people who are working in our two Chinese offices. So we've been following them very carefully. They've been working from home, remotely, and they've been telling us what it's like to, to actually be living there. So uh, 
no one believes that the international response should be more standardised across no. the board. But do, what do we think about the leadership in all of this? The WHO, for example, the World Health Organization, uh, has there been clear leadership uh, from, from that perspective in what countries should be doing, how big the risk is, information that's getting to, to I, people? I think if you look on the WHO website, it's been, there's been one, an active, um, there's a sit, a sit rep every day, a situation report every day, which gives the information about the numbers, the new cases and the deaths. And um, over time, that uh, website has become much more complicated to get round because there is guidance on every single aspect. There's also been a ramping up of support to countries in um, sub-Saharan Africa to help them get ready should they get cases to be able to test. Because if you don't have, you need the kits to test. You, the US well, found it, that. Is it more of a problem it's, in less developed countries? Well, it is because if you if you think that we're a developed country and we would struggle if we were to get yes, to the eighty percent, we, we would Bob, struggle as Bob here. Says, we'd struggle. So people, you would, imagine countries with less developed. If you've only got sort of systems. a very few doctors, I mean, the figures in places like Namibia, very small numbers of healthcare staff. And you then, and, and they've got a wide range of disease, they're already dealing with malaria. You add this into the mix, uh, it, it's, you know, really going to stretch the systems and they are going to need aid, and which is why the WHO has called for aid from, uh, from uh, across from the developed world to actually help to support initiatives should they occur. So the WHO has been sharing information. It was about maybe six weeks ago, they had a, all the scientists together to look at the different bits of, of the chain, you know, what works in prevention, where the, what antivirals, what, what about a vaccine, et cetera. So they, uh, you know, they had, they, and they shared all that information. There was a visit by, led by Bruce Aylwood um, from WHO that's published a very detailed report about lessons to learn from Wuhan which is really helpful for everybody else because right. it tells you about how you know how long does it take to get the infection what happens if in the phase when you may not have symptoms are you infectious what happens when you get symptoms what's the cause of the disease who are the most vulnerable in the population and that helps you prepare and, and so that's the, the healthcare side. In terms of financial assistance, yeah. and what have bodies like the World Bank done, the IMF, are, are, are they, have they had fast enough responses to try and underpin economies? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I did a table of all the policy actions in March and I was running out of space. So the World Bank has said they're going to make 12 billion available. The IMF have said they were going to make 50 billion available, especially for developing countries who need it for their healthcare systems. We've seen central banks around the world respond very quickly. The Federal Reserve had an emergency meeting last Tuesday outside of its normal monetary policy cycle and they cut by 50 basis points interest rates. The last time they did that was during the global financial crisis right. in 2008. So there's been a lot of action. However, I would say that on you know what we need for this crisis is kind of slightly different because the nature of the shock is different. So we need aid for targeted aid on the fiscal side. So certain industries, for example, the airline industry, for example, small businesses, they will see a fall in their activity mm. and therefore a fall in their revenue. And they may not be able to roll over some of their loans. So we saw Flybe and we've seen a, a Chinese airline also go bust in the last week. Right. So it might be that what we need is kind of more targeted fiscal measures for vulnerable industries. Do you think China will recover from this in terms of um, demand for its, its products? Because uh, are people seeing this as a a, a disease yeah. that was created in, in China and therefore they want to put up more barriers or trade barriers or whatever? I wouldn't say that they see it as a disease created in China. What they do see is the dependence on China in terms of their supply chains. They probably are worried that they want to diversify their risks. And what we've seen and heard from our clients is that if you don't get a part from China, it's quite hard to source from an alternative provider. So there are many roads that lead to China in terms of the supply chain. Right. So they've become much more aware of their, their risk exposure and they will, they will definitely want to rethink that. And that's something that we've seen also during the global financial crises. We have seen the supply chains reorient themselves in, in light of a shock. Um, and just finally, on the on the issue of, of how healthcare workers deal with with an unfolding crisis like this, I think we can assume that here, especially in the UK, 
very small numbers at the moment, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. What are healthcare workers saying? What do you want to say about what it is you need to, to help you uh, deal with this? I think that healthcare workers generally are quite worried about the prospect of a significant uptick in demand on, on, on their services. They worry how they will cope. They worry about how many of them may get infected and have to leave, leave the workplace, putting extra strain on those people left behind. But if I could return to the economic aspect on an individual level, we've had 10 years of austerity. People are under economic stress. Uh, we know that their diets and the stress and the conditions they're living in aren't as good, so they're potentially less resilient to fighting off infection. On top of that, we've got people working in precarious jobs who, when they have to decide whether they forego an income or you know, isolate themselves, would they be making the right decision? And we haven't heard those strong reassurances from government how they will protect income loss on an individual these basis. Are the, these are the kind of messages that the government has to give to, so that uh, communities and populations as a whole yeah. will take the, the best decision to, to stop coronavirus spreading. Um, thank you very much indeed, all of you, for joining me in the studio. Really, really fascinating uh, discussion. And thank you for watching. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But for now, from me and all the team here, bye-bye.